Okay, we're on there. Okay, my name is Liz Flynn, and I'm the Eastern District Manager for the Wichita Falls District Office of Congressman Ronnie Jackson. Today's date is October 20th, 2021, and I'm interviewing Bill Miller uh, in Bowie, Texas. And this interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. So Bill, thank you so much for taking the time to do this today and for yes, your service. Honored to do it. And um, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. Where, where were you, where'd you graduate high school? Where were you when you decided you wanted to go uh, into the Navy, I believe? Okay, let me go back prior to high school. <clears throat> I tell people a lot that my family was like a band of gypsies. We moved around all the time. My dad was self-employed in the radio and TV repair business, and we moved around from town to town. And uh, out in West Texas is where I, uh, I grew up in Leveland. And uh, because we moved around so much, uh, me and my siblings were having a hard time with uh, keeping our grades up in school. So when it come to uh, my 11th grade year, we were gonna move again. And I told my dad and mother that I'm not going to move again and move to another school in my 11th grade. My older brother of two years had already quit school in the 10th grade, and he was talking about joining the Navy. So I decided I'm going to join the Navy too. So I quit school in the 11th grade. So I'm a high school dropout. I quit school and joined the Navy. At the age, as soon as I turned 17, I joined the Navy. And because I was 17, my parents had to sign for me. So my parents had a sign for me to be able to join the Navy. And the reason I joined, chose the Navy was, I guess, because my brother had already chosen the Navy. And, and I kind of grew up watching some of the war movies and uh, uh, Victory at Sea movies and this and that. And I thought, the Navy's the place to go. And some friends and family members said, well, if you join the Navy, you'll always have a clean place to sleep and good food to eat. So that wasn't the main reason, but uh, anyway, I chose the Navy. And how did your parents feel about you dropping out of school and joining the Navy? It didn't really bother them. They knew we were all failing. As a matter of fact, uh, out of all of us six siblings, uh, only one of us graduated from high school. The rest of us dropped out. And of the six, I was the first one to get married. And, and I always tell a story that in 1961, it was a big year for me. I quit school, I joined the Navy, and I got married, and that was over 60 years ago, and I'm still married to the same lady. Oh, I tell everybody she married me for my money because I was making $97 a month back then. So anyway, so anyway, that's how I got started. Okay, and and I think just to complete the story, you did get your GED. You yes, me. while I was still on active duty, I got my GED in 1968. Uh, I was stationed up in uh, Stillwater, Oklahoma. I was an instructor at the Naval Reserve Training Center in Stillwater. And one of my neighbors worked for the Oklahoma Department of Education, and he found out that I had not got my GED. And boy, he got on me right away and helped me show what I, showed me what I needed to do to get my GED. So my GED is from actually Oklahoma, but I'm just as proud of it as if it were from any high school anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. So tell me where... Um Why did you pick, well, you, you took me through why you picked the service branch uh, you joined, and uh, where were you sent after you? Okay, when we, uh, back then, <clears throat> we had to, we were living in Fort Worth, and uh, they, uh, they sent us to Dallas to get in, in, inducted into the military in, in Dallas, so they put us on a bus, those of here in Fort Worth, and we rode the bus to Dallas, and that's where we got sworn in and took the oath of office and they put us on a train and the train left Dallas, made a stop in Fort Worth, uh, just, that's just the rate they did at that time. And I didn't know it, but my wife-to-be and some of her friends were there at the train station in Fort Worth to, to, to wait for me and greet me and I thought, wow, what's this all about? So I guess I started falling in love with her at that time. So there we took that train from Fort Worth all the way to San Diego. And oh, it was nice. First time in my life I'd ever ridden on a train. So we made it to San Diego, and uh, they took us into boot camp, and they started yelling and screaming and hollering at me. And I thought, whoa, what's this all about? I didn't think it'd be this way, but that was part of the way uh, boot camp worked back then. So I was in San Diego, Naval, Naval Training Center in San Diego, for the six or eight weeks of boot camp. I can't remember how long it was. But that was uh, in January, 1960, because I just turned, I mean February, because I just turned uh, 17 the last day of January. 
so I went through all the boot camp and uh, uh, I didn't mind it. I, uh, I, I didn't want some of the physical things we had to do, but uh, I didn't know how to swim. So they put me in a special swimming class and threw me in the water and they taught me how to swim. Even though it was just dog paddling, I was able to swim. So when it come time to uh, graduate from boot camp and get our training, they uh, sold us in. Uh, uh, <clears throat> well, since you're a high school dropout, you don't get to go to any formal Navy training. I did not know that. So I didn't get to go to school after boot camp. I went straight aboard ship for my first active duty in the Navy. And uh, prior to that, while I was a young kid out in Leveland, I got my ham radio operator license and I learned the Morse code. And because I was very proficient with the Morse code, I found my way to the radio shack aboard the ship. And I said, hey guys, I wanna be a radio man. So they said, well, who are you? What do you know? Da, 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 da. Anyway, I showed them I could use the Morse code and boy, they were impressed. But it's because of my training with, as a ham radio operator. So I became a radio operator aboard the ship and I was on that ship for four years, four years. And- uh, what, our, what, what were those years? 1960 to 1964. Uh, so by this time, my wife-to-be and I had been writing letters back and forth. We didn't have cell phones or computers or internet back then. So uh, we talked and thought, well, we're gonna get married after I finished four years of Navy and her four years of college. Her parents only agreed to let her marry me if she would stay at home and graduate her senior year, which she did. So we decided we can't wait four years. So um, and still again, 1960, I took leave rode the Greyhound bus from San Diego to Fort Worth and we got married in July of 1960. And, uh, 61, I'm sorry, 1961. So, uh, <clears throat> from there, I went, we were together nine days on our little honeymoon. And I got on the bus to go back to San Diego and we had $6. I gave her three and I kept three. And I, cause I knew when I got back to San Diego aboard ship, I'd have a place to sleep and eat. And she had a place to sleep and eat with her mom and dad in Fort Worth. So uh, we finished up, we got the marriage and all that behind us. And then I got ordered, the ship got orders to go for a nine month deployment to the Western Pacific. Now this was prior to Vietnam. So here I go, board ship, we leave San Diego and go, and we basically stationed and ported in and out of uh, the Philippines in Subic Bay. And during that time, we patrolled up and down the South China Sea because it was just years before Vietnam. So we were kind of playing war games <clears throat> back in then. So uh, we finished the, the six month or nine month tour in, in uh, the West Pack, we call it Western Pacific. Came back to San Diego, Shirley rode the bus to San Diego. We lived in the first little apartment for a few months. And then October, 1962 comes around, Miss, a Cuban Missile Crisis. We were gonna invade Cuba. So my ship, along with several others, left San Diego on our way to invade Cuba. So we said our goodbyes because we were both scared that we're going to war. So our ship left and went through the Panama Canal and went out there and steamed around in the Caribbean. We, we had tons of Marines on my ship. I was in a, on an amphibious ship. And our goal was to invade Cuba. Well, that didn't happen, so we turned around after all the negotiations took place. We went back to San Diego. Well, let me stop you there. Yeah. How close did you get to Cuba? Uh, we could see it off, uh, off, we were several miles off, uh, off of Cuba. We never got close to, you know, go there, but we spun around, steamed around the, in the Caribbean for two or three months. I don't remember how long it was, but we, went to, we made port in Jamaica and Puerto Rico for refueling and supplies and this and that, but we never actually got close enough to Cuba. But we could see the Russian trawlers that are out there taking missiles and stuff there. We pass them and their, their planes would buzz our ships and whatnot for harassment things. So anyway, we never, we never invaded, we came back home. And uh, Shirley came back to San Diego where she rode the bus. And uh, during that time we were in San Diego, I went to a teletype repair school, learned how to repair and uh, work on teletype equipment because we had those on our ship by that time. And then we got orders to go back overseas again for another another nine months back over to the West Pack. So we said our goodbyes and I'll go back to the same place in the Philippines for another nine months. And then on the when that tour was over, we were hunting, coming back to uh, San Diego. And between San Diego and, and Hawaii, I was working the midnight shift in the radio shack and on, uh, on the ship we had our, uh, some of our incoming messages would come via teletype. 
And on the teletypes, when there was a very high priority, urgent message, it was a way to ring a bell and ding, 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 ding on the teletypes. And when you heard that dinging, you knew that was an important message. And it was like three o'clock in the morning, I don't remember. So we didn't get those very often. So I go in there in the room and pull this message off and tear it off. And it was a flash urgent message. President Kennedy had been shot. Wow, we didn't know what to do. So at, in that time, it was uh, our job to um, take that message and present it to the commanding officer, the captain of the ship, no matter where or what time of the day it was. Three o'clock in the morning, I put it on a special clipboard, go in there and knock on the captain's door, wake him up. <clears throat> I said, Captain, we've got an urgent message here. So he read the message and he said, wow. So we didn't know what to do. So out of uh, drill and practice, we went to general quarters. And that means bat man your battle station. But here we are out in the middle of the ocean between San Diego and Hawaii, but we didn't know what was going on in the States. Again, this was in 1962 and we didn't have a lot of uh, internet and rapid communications like we do today. So we did not know what was going on. So we finally found out what had happened. We made it back to San Diego and uh, I took leave and came back, rode the Greyhound to Fort Worth again. And uh, <clears throat> at that time, I think Shirley and I, we bought a car and we drove it back to San Diego because I'm still stationed on this ship. And we're in and out of port two weeks out at sea, to a week or two in. So Shirley's basically there by herself while I'm in and out at sea for training there in San Diego. And then I get orders to go to the Philippines. And because I was E5 at the time, we got to have what was called concurrent travel. And that meant my wife got to go with me. So we flew to the Philippines and I got my first shore duty, uh, uh, not on the ship, but at in, in the Naval Communication Station in the Philippines. She got to go with me. And back then they had a sponsor that would meet new people coming in. We flew into Clark Air Force Base, which is there uh, in the Philippines. And our sponsors met us and they said, oh, welcome to the Philippines. And we're here to help you get acclimated to your life on the base here, but we just got some sad news. A Gulf of Tonkin incident just happened, and we are now engaged in Vietnam War. So we've been told that they're going to send all of the, the dependents back to the States. But, oh, no. Well, as it turned out, that didn't happen. Shirley got to stay with me, and I was there for a little over two years uh, on base, and my job then was working on and installing teletype equipment because uh, that communication station in the Philippines was a hot spot because all of the traffic to and from Vietnam went through us. And uh, we were installing equipment fast and furious to, to keep up with the demand. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, while we were there, our daughter was born at the Navy hospital. So our daughter was born in the Philippines. She's a uh, U.S. citizen because she was born on a military base. But she has a real neat birth certificate from the Secretary of State. Well, during that time, Vietnam got escalated more and more heavily involved. So uh, the Navy had some, um, they're like these moving pods you see now. They were vans with the equipment. We had five different vans we could airlift anywhere in the world and put in a communication station. Transmitters, receivers, message center, operations room. Anyway, a, a complete communication center in these portable buildings that could be airlifted. So we sent our vans to Da Nang, Vietnam. So we sent a crew over there first, and they were there for three or four months, and they started rotating, asking for volunteers to go. So I volunteered to go. And, and you had not been to Vietnam yet? Not yet. And, and this was what year? This was 1965. 65. Okay. My daughter was born in June of 65. I went to Vietnam, I think, in August of 65. And during that time, I flew my wife and new baby back to the States, uh, to, to show off the baby the grand, to the grandparents and her parents. And we didn't really know the severity of what was going on in Vietnam at that time. It had just begun, or begun officially. I felt safe going over there. I, I wasn't going to a combat mission. I was going over there as a support to install and help the Marines with their communications equipment. But I was there in Da Nang, and the Marines took us under their wing and took care of us, fed us, made sure we had food and water. One neat, neat thing, these uh, vans that we had for our communications equipment had to be air conditioned to keep the equipment cool. Well, this one van, we could drop the temperature down to 65 degrees, and the Marines found out about that, and they said, whoa, we can put our beer in there. So we filled that one van up with their beer. <coughs> in exchange, they'd feed us nice steaks and stuff like that. Well, we had a good time doing that. So when my time was up, but meanwhile, we didn't know about Agent Orange back then. But we heard about something that they were spraying some type of defoilant to spray in the jungles to kill the leaves off so we could see the Viet Cong and whatnot. 
and uh, didn't know anything about it. But as it turned out, I got my dose of Agent Orange while I was there in Da Nang. In, and in what form did you get it? Well, we think we got it from our drinking water because we were there on the base, uh, kind of as an Air Force base and a Marine base, all kind of combined there. But we had to go quite a ways to get our drinking water in these big metal cans. And during the uh, transversing from our camp to the water supply, we probably picked it up, but our water was contaminated, just what they told me. So I picked that up, and uh, I didn't have it as bad as so many other folks have. I've got some issues, but uh, thankfully that's being taken care of. So when my time was up, I flew back to the Philippines and finished my tour of duty there. And then I got uh, orders to uh, the Naval Reserve Training Center in Stillwater, Oklahoma. As I said, as an instructor, there were four of us on active duty there. And what we did was we taught the... Uh, Basically, the college kids at that time, we taught them their classroom basic military requirements before they went off to boot camp. So when they got to San Diego or wherever the boot camp was, it just modified a couple of weeks boot camp. So I did that, and, and, and I cussed the reserves. because it, I, That was the worst tour of duty I had, actually, because uh, even though it was in the States, uh, I was gone three nights a week, and uh, actually four nights. Worked every day, Monday through Friday, but uh four nights a week I was gone to other places uh, training and teaching classes so it was really a horrible duty station so I cussed the reserves and then when my eight years of active duty right actually a little over eight years I joined the reserves the commanding officer of our little unit there swore me in and I, he was a good man so I, I spent the next 19 years as a reservist uh, actively working and drilling with the naval reserves so all total with my eight years active duty 19 years reservist, that was 27 years. So I'm, I'm of age now where I can draw my military retirement and my benefits, which are very good. And I would do it again if I could. And you, so you didn't, when you were in Vietnam, you, you didn't experience any combat? No combat. The night before I left, right there where we were uh, camped at, the, 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 the Marines or Air Force, I'm not sure, were building some storage tanks for fuel. And they were, well, three or 400 yards from us. I could see the big metal tanks. And the VC thought they were either full or in the process of being filled with fuel. So they started lobbing grenades and mortars into those uh, fuel tank areas and blow, trying to blow them up. So we got in our foxholes and uh, we, were, we spent all night watching the, the mortars going across. Of course, we couldn't do anything. I had a little forty-five pistol. I couldn't do anything with that. But uh, it was pretty uh, visible. You, all night long, you could hear and see the uh, ammunition going off on the ground and through the air. So it was scary and spooky. But uh, it ended over the, overnight and uh, I came home. And then, like I said, I finished up my tour in the Philippines and then back in Oklahoma. And then that's where I was, was discharged in April of 1969. Moved to Fort Worth. And because of my training in the Navy, I got a good job in the business machine company. So the Navy did more than one thing for me. It taught me a trade I could use in civilian life. And it grew me up. Here I was a 16, a 17-year-old kid. I didn't know anything. I was dumb and ignorant. But it grew me up and it taught me a trade. And it also it instilled in me the value of an education because me being a high school dropout, I missed so many opportunities. So I told people that I don't care if it's a school to teach me how to sweep and mop a floor, I want to go. So I've always reached out on trying to learn how to do something and, and, and learn, learn more. And you learned how to swim. Learned how to swim. <laughs> and even in my old age today, I'm still anger, uh, hungry and anxious to learn new things. I learn something new every day. So uh, when 9-11 happened, uh, I was chomping at the bits and ready to go. Of course, I was too old, but I, I called the recruiters. I was living in Kansas City at the time. I said, hey, I want to re-up. They said, how old are you? I said, I told them my age. I said, sorry, old man, you can't do it. You're too old. How but old I, were you? <clears throat> I was 55. And you would have reenlisted. Absolutely, absolutely, because they needed people with my skill sets at that time. But I was too old. Well, that's honorable. But uh, I would do it. I would do it today if I could. But uh, anyway, so the Navy was been very, very good to me and my family. Uh, when I joined, <clears throat> I, a younger brother joined the Navy after me, and the youngest of our four boys, uh, he joined the Army. So. Uh, of the four boys in my family, three of us were Navy, one's Army. Of course, I stayed in longer than the rest of them, but, uh, uh, but the younger brother uh, picked up some Agent Orange from Vietnam with his ship off the coast of uh, Vietnam, 
because they were doing close maneuvers right off the coast. And, and what repercussions <coughs> did you, what issues did you have with Agent Orange? Um, or do you have? Diabetes and neuropathy, extremity, um, neuropathy in the lower and upper extremities. I still have problems with my hands and my feet and the legs because of that and the diabetes. Thankfully, the diabetes is under control with medication, but um, I didn't know anything about that until probably 2006. I was diagnosed with uh, diabetes and I uh, thought, wow, where'd this come from? And not until oh, three or four years later did I find out that this is an Agent Orange thing and there's benefits available from the VA. So when I moved to Monte County in 2007, I contacted the veteran service officer at the courthouse and I said, hey, I think I may have something going on here with Agent Orange. Actually, another uh, military man I met by accident told me about it. So I checked into it and found out, yeah, there's, there's, there's benefits for folks who have the Agent Orange exposure. So I, I filed my claim with the Veteran Service Office and uh, waited and waited and waited. And uh, the Veteran Service Officer at the time said, Bill, he said, the problem we're having is there's so much bureaucracy in the VA, they're hoping you'll either die or give up being frustrated with your claim not being processed. And he said, you don't know how many people I've worked with filing their claims who just gave up. And some actually died before they could get treated. And that was such a bad time. That, now this was 2007, and it had been going on for a few years before then. So as I mean, I turned up and I, and I was persistent filing the claim, calling. I called my congressman, called my senators. It fell on deaf ears. And I don't need to mention their names. The people that's watching this can go back into 2007, 2008, 2009, check out who those congressmen and senators were that represented me here in Monte County, Texas. They offered no help. Whereas you heard one of our, our friends while ago talk about Ronnie Jackson, what he's doing, what he's done, and how supportive he is. That's what we needed then, and we have it now, and we just need more of it. So um, uh, there were some bad times. Now, as far as me being mistreated or whatnot from Vietnam, I never received that, basically because of maybe where I was, where I was stationed, but I knew about it. I saw it on the news, and it's just sickening to see how our veterans were being treated. And it seems like it was mainly on the East Coast and West Coast where those guys were so mistreated. And that kind of garbage still goes on today in those parts of the country, and that's so dis disrespectful. But I've had a good time in the Navy. It... Uh, it, uh, it grew, like I said, it grew me up and taught me a skill, and uh, uh, I never regret it. And neither does my wife, neither does my family. So, well, well, that that's that's great. It's great to hear, you know, from the from the gentleman I've interviewed. You know, so like Carl, just had yeah. just a, a horrific experience, mm -hmm. um, but he doesn't seem bitter. And, and that's amazing. That's sure. amazing. It's, it's... If I can go back to my, my last tour of duty where I was on active duty up in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> those places aren't in existence anymore because things have changed. But basically those uh, reserve training centers were in college towns. And uh, like I said, all of our recruits were basically 99% were college kids going to college and they wanted to participate in the Navy. Mm -hmm. And during that time, we had a lot of training films, old black and white 16 millimeter films that we'd show in the classrooms. And a lot of them were from World War II, vintage films showing the battles of World War II and, and all this and that. And those kids at that time were very uh, uh, attentive and anxious to see and learn about what's going on in the, in the world. We didn't have that... Um, attitude that some of the folks to do today have about our military. They were anxious to learn and go, and they saw what was going on with the, the veterans who had, had come back and were still coming back. This was in 1960, uh, 68, 69, 66, when I was in, in Oklahoma. So a lot of that garbage, the war was still going on. And uh, so uh, the, the kids that were joining up then had a, a more positive outlook, I think, on the world and the life that they were wanting to do. Otherwise, they wouldn't have uh, joined the military voluntarily. Mm -hmm. They wanted to go do something beneficial. Mm -hmm. So uh, hopefully that changes. Maybe it's changed. I think a lot of it changed during uh, after 9-11. A lot mm -hmm. of folks joined up. 
but somehow it's kind of faded away, I think, today. But uh, it, everything's cyclical. It'll turn around. I'm optimistic that it'll, it'll turn around. Mm -hmm. And and it seemed like you had a, didn't have any problem readjusting to civilian life when you left. No, not at all. Not at all. If I can go back to Cuba for a minute and tell you an interesting story. <clears throat> because of my hobby with communications, <clears throat> with playing with the radios and ham radio back before I joined the Navy. When we got down in the uh, <clears throat> Caribbean, uh, again, this was in, in 1962, uh, we relied, all the ships down there, there were several ships and aircraft carriers. We all relied on our communications by radio. We didn't have satellites. So we got down there for some reason, there was a dead spot. We couldn't pick up any radio communications at all to find out what's going on because we couldn't do anything without getting a message via the radio uh, as to what, what our orders would be. So we reached a dead spot. None of the other ships could copy the, the, the radios. So I told our communi communications officer, I said, hey, uh, Lieutenant, I've got an idea. Uh, we've got lifeboats here, and in those lifeboats, they've got balloons where you can launch a balloon and put an antenna on that balloon up in the sky. I said, I think that little antenna is about 20 feet long. I would like to, your permission to launch one of those balloons and tie about a 300 foot wire on that balloon off the fantail, which is the rear of the ship, and stick that up and we'll use that as a receiving antenna for our radios. And he said, well, what good will that do? And I, and I told him, I think it'll work. We'll be able to pick up our reception because the shipboard antennas were not very long and very efficient in that area. So he said, sure, go for it. Well, let me run it by the captain. So he told the captain of the ship what we needed to do. And the captain was very concerned because we didn't know what's going on. We, we were several hours without communications. So we launched this balloon and ran it through there. And sure enough, we were, we were hearing everything we needed to hear. The well, funny thing, I guess he didn't tell the admiral down there on the big carrier what was going on. So the admiral calls and said, what's that balloon doing over there? What? Get that thing down. And, and our captain told the admiral what we were doing. And the admiral said, well, launch another one if you need to. <laughs> and some other ships did. They launched balloons too for that period of time. So that was a kind of unique story that uh, because of my experiences as, as a hobby before the Navy kind of played in to help me with communications while I was aboard ship. Well, that made you very resourceful. That's well, yes, sure. it did. <laughs> yeah. So that was a, a fun thing to do. But did, did, Talking about the Bay of Pigs, did you... Did y'all know what was going down when you were, when you were out Well, this at was sea? after the Bay of Pigs. After the Bay of this Pigs. This was because of the Russians putting the missile silos in Cuba. The, the Russians were bringing in shiploads of missiles and launching equipment. They were building um, missile launching bases there in Cuba, which they could launch right over into the United States. And I remember just before we left San Diego, uh, we were bringing on all kinds of equipment, special equipment, and the, the guys came into the radio shack and they needed a clear space on a desk. They said, we'll take this spot right here. And I said, what is that? And he said, we can't talk about it. It's a piece of classified equipment. And uh, so let me finish this. So they put this machine up there and they start testing it and it has a big old drum with a piece of paper and uh, made a funny sound and made a, had a stinky smell to it. And I said, what is that? Well, it was a facsimile machine. So they hooked that up to our radios and this drum turned around it burned an image on there and we were able to get images for certain areas that the U-2 planes were flying over Cuba and that we could see where the missiles were. So this old antique first generation of a facsimile machine was screeching, screeching away, they're burning its image on this piece of paper. So that's how we, and, and I'm sure the other bases uh, had more pr precise better images than we did so that we could see what the Russians were doing there in Cuba. So they had those rocket launchers and missiles there on Cuba until Kennedy said, you either pull them out or we're going to invade. Well, they had a standoff and we, we won. Well, Y'all were part of the standoff. Oh yeah, we were there. Our, my ship, we, we carried Marines. We were amphibious uh, troop transport. We carried the Marines that you see in the old World War II movies. We'd lay a uh, a cargo net over the side of the ship and the Marines would climb down this net into the little boats and the little boats would circle around and they would hit the beach and the front would drop down. We we normally had about 1,400 Marines on there. We had almost 3,000 Marines 
on that ship ready to re hit the did, beach and invade Cuba. Did you so you felt that pressure that we were on the that that we were on the brink of war? Oh yes, definitely. And that's when I told my wife goodbye. I said we don't know if we'll see you again or not. When she left San Diego to drive back to Dallas or Fort Worth, we were headed to Cuba, and our mission was to invade Cuba. And uh, the Marines were everywhere on my ship. They were being trained and pumped up to hit the beach and go in and invade Cuba. And uh, <clears throat> that's not the, this was not this was after the Bay of Pigs thing. Right. This was just called the. There's several movies. Missiles out there. of October. Yeah, missile a Cuban missile crisis of mm -hmm. 1962 is what mm -hmm. it's headlined. And back in San Diego, we watched the news on TV back then. There wasn't any CNN or Fox News, you know, just had the three networks. And every night we'd see updates from President Kennedy giving us updates. And when he said, we're going, so we knew then we were, we were headed for How work. long were you all stationed out there? That's those, about three months. <clears throat> in those waters? Yeah, in those waters. Yeah, because we didn't know what was going to happen. And every day, the negotiations between Russia and the U.S., Change our attitude. Gosh, so so y'all, you were on edge for three months out Absolutely. there. Absolutely. My goodness. And when we got word to come back to San Diego, we made it back through the Panama Canal, which is a challenge to some of the big aircraft carriers because of the overhangs from the carriers were greater than the width of the, the Panama Canal, so they had to do a lot of modifications to get our ships through the canal. So what was the mood on the ship uh, during that time? I think everybody was anxious because, you know, we were... I was, uh, you know, my late teens, uh, early 20s. I was late teens, I guess. Uh, we didn't know what war was like other than what we'd seen on the movies. John Wayne, you know. Uh, I think we were anxious to go get it done. Now, the Marines, they had a different attitude. They were, they were ready to go kill. And as a matter of fact, on our way back to San Diego, they were so upset and mad, they started fighting each other aboard ship because they were pumped up. And uh, they were upset that they weren't going. They, they didn't get to, to hit the beach. Yeah. Now there may be other reasons why this one guy got killed. One was even thrown overboard, which we never found. But uh, I don't want to speak bad about the Marines, but they were so pumped up and trained that we're going to go hit the beach and do our job. And we didn't. But I guess thankfully we didn't. But uh, who knows whether we should have invaded or not. But but um, that I guess that's the closest I felt like going to the actual war. My, my time in Vietnam, I never felt really threatened because I wasn't in there fighting on the battle lines with the guys. I saw it, I could hear it, but I wasn't close enough to feel it like I, I think I did during on the Cuba thing. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Wow. So. That was being, <clears throat> yeah, very just close to history, too. Yes. Too close, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and and when you when your wartime service ended, uh, what what when was that? Well, I know that you was were in sixty nine. I was still in Stillwater, Oklahoma. In Stillwater. Yeah. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, during that time, uh, our daughter was born in the Philippines, and while we were in Stillwater, we had a, a son born, and uh, he he died four months later, and uh, he uh, his, his what liver happened? his liver didn't fully function for him and whatnot. So Sorry. that happened in all, uh, December of 1968. I'm due to get out of the Navy in uh, April of 69. Uh, it was a very traumatic experience for both of us. So I sent my wife on home back to Fort Worth. That was five hours away from, from Stillwater. And she moved in with her mom and dad during that time. So just a few weeks before I actually got discharged, I came home and uh, we started looking for a house and we bought our first home in, in uh, Haltom City, which is a suburb of Fort Worth. We didn't know if we could, uh, we got a VA loan, but before the, the, the loan closed, the interest went up a little bit and the, our in, our house payment went from $91 to $94 and we didn't know if we could afford that or not. Because uh, just out of the day, but anyway, we, we made it. We bought our first home and, and because of my training, I was hired by a business machine company there in Fort Worth and uh, they hired me because of my military Navy training experience. I remember the, the manager, told the, uh, the district manager, we need to hire Miller because he's an E5, uh, he's an E6 petty officer, and he's got all this training. We need we need people like that in our organization because I was mature, had a skill, and had some maturity about me and, and some knowledge. So uh, they offered me the job, and uh, I've had many more since then. But it all goes back to my 
time in the Navy. I give the Navy for all, all that credit for training me and growing me up. Well, it's refreshing to hear uh, such a, you had such a positive experience mm -hmm. during, you know, your time in the military. Yeah. So. We had our struggles uh, early on in San Diego when we were in and out because uh, we lived in a, you know, a little apartment, a little rent house, and we didn't have a car. Uh, I didn't know how to drive when I met Shirley, and uh, we got our first car in San Diego, and uh, we'd ride the bus or walk to places in San Diego. We'd ride the bus to the Navy base and go to the picture show free, and uh, popcorn was 10 cents, and uh, we would... Uh, walk to the grocery store and uh, so we it was a simple life but we were happy we didn't have anything but we were happy life was good life was good didn't know it but it was good <laughs> so all right well bill thank you so much that was really interesting and i appreciate you taking me through it and thank you for your service and uh um i think you know all the interviews we did today were just fantastic and sure i think it's going to be a great addition the if I can close by saying something about Ronnie Jackson, sure. as, as I mentioned, uh, I grew up in Level Land, and, and um, when I saw him on Fox News indicating that he was going to get out of the Navy and run for Congress, I thought, wow, this is neat. I recognized him from when President Trump tried to put him on as uh, Secretary of the VA. But when he mentioned where he's from, I thought, wow, I'm from that area. So I made contact with Ronnie Jackson at the time. and. And I, we talked on the phone. This was back in November of uh, 2019. And I said, well, Admiral, I'm just an enlisted man. Uh, how do I address you now? He said, just call me Ronnie. So I call him Ronnie at his request. So I had just got elected mayor of Bowie in November of 2019. And I told Ronnie that, hey, I'm, I'm in your district. And uh, when you start your campaign, I'd love to have you come here and I'll host a, a meeting for you. And he did. He had his first campaign as congressman elect or congressman. What, what do you call that? He was running for Congress. He had it here in Bowie, Texas in November. And that was in December of 2019. And I'm very glad that they did. And he has got so much more he can do for us. And me and all the veterans right here are very appreciative of what he's doing, what he's done. And uh, thank you, Ronnie. Okay, we'll end it there. Okay. Thank you.